Welcome everyone, and so happy to have you joining us as we begin our series of Live and Learn, uh, kind of a, a study through the book of Ephesians. Excited to be doing this and looking through uh, this letter that Paul writes to a church in Ephesus. And I, I know we say live and learn, but the way Paul kind of structures it is learn and live. And so we're going to be talking a little bit about that. And joining me I have, with me, I have uh, Pastor Mike Roberts. So glad you're here. Glad to be here. Yeah, it's exciting. I'm, I, I think this is going to be a really cool opportunity for our church to kind of yeah. dive into this, this book of Ephesians and kind of try, try to apply it to our lives, right? Yeah, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be really practical. And I, you know, I think you're going to connect very well to this book. So yeah, yeah, for good. sure. Definitely. Yeah. And what's cool is, is in this letter that Paul writes, I mean, it's six chapters, right? Yep. Uh, but it's broken up into like two different sections, like we were saying, mm -hmm. that, that idea of, of live and learn. But Paul starts off with the learning and then he gets into the living mm -hmm. and it's three chapters each. So, yeah. so it nice. splits nicely. Yes. Yeah. Always, always <laughs> nice to have that. Uh, but we're going to break it up into 12 weeks and okay. kind of go through it that way. But, you know, even still, I would say, you know, you and I were looking at this earlier, trying to figure out how do we, how do we divide Ephesians, it, you know, week to week. And we landed on 12 weeks, but the reality is we could probably go 12 months if we really wanted to. Yeah. Uh, but we won't, we won't do that to you guys because that, <laughs> that would be a lot. Uh, but no, we're, I'm looking forward to it. I know we've got a lot of different staff members that are going to be joining yep. us and kind of working through and, and sharing each, uh, each week, yep. um, teaching from, uh, from the book. And, and I, I like that too, because you're going to get a little peek into our own study methods and techniques and things like that. And, and so our hope is that we can even model that, yeah. right? Um, yeah. I don't know if I'm going to necessarily say like, okay, this is how you study your Bible, do this, 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 and this. Right. Um, and and each each person might have moments where they share with you a little bit about that, of how what they're looking at in particularly. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I think it's going to be a good model, and yeah. people can look at how we're studying God's Word, and, and maybe even try to do that in in their own life a little bit. Yeah. So it'll be good. So not only are we going to learn from Ephesians, we're going to learn how to apply it to our lives, and then even take some of those principles and apply them to, you know, any book of the Bible that right. somebody's in, right? Because um, yeah. we kind of ask those questions, the the the, the three simple questions: mm -hmm. What does it say? What does it mean and how does it apply, yep. right? Um, and, and whether you're in the book of Ephesians or you're in Colossians or Genesis or Isaiah, it doesn't matter, right? Yep. You, you still ask yourself those three basic questions. Uh, one of the things that I, I've heard this saying quite a bit, maybe you've heard it, but uh, I, I really enjoy this. I, I think it's very accurate, but, you know, the Bible can't mean something to me that it didn't mean to the original audience. Right. And so, you know, sometimes we get tripped up in that, right? Yeah. We, we try to take our own context, our own culture, and lay it over Scripture and try to interpret it that way rather than diving into the, the context and the culture of the original audience. Yeah. Um, and when we, when we fail to do that, we, we miss the meaning of, yeah. of Scripture sometimes. Yeah. And yeah. so, um, you know, and then the application, you know, you're, you might apply the text differently to your life than, than me. And yeah. so that, that's kind of, you know, open-ended, so to say, but yeah. the, when we ask the questions, what does it say and what does it mean? Like, there's, there's right and wrong answers to yeah. that. Yeah, so, for sure. so we have to be careful yeah. when we yeah. do that. And, and, you know, I, 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 what I do appreciate is the fact that the Holy Spirit works in believers lives and, and illuminates scripture to us. So, so we can go to God's word and, and, and get a good understanding of what God is communicating to us through his word. But then sometimes when we get into the the culture and the context and all that other kind of stuff, like maybe that doesn't always pop out in illumination. Like sometimes we need tools. Yeah, to, we got to work. Yeah, we got to put in the work, right? Yeah. Um, so you know, I know I have my tools. Yeah. You 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 have your tools. Yeah. Um, we you and I are both pastors, so we've 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 got libraries and all that other kind of stuff. But yeah. you know, there was a time in my life where I wasn't a pastor and I didn't have libraries and stuff. But I still went to God's Word, and and there were still tools available to me. Yeah. So, like Mike, what who? If, if somebody's watching and, and they're like, man, I, I wish I had a library, but I don't, and I'm limited to resources, like what, what are maybe some good tools they could use um, as they study God's Word, no matter where they're at in, in the Bible? Great. Yeah, um, first tool is the Word of God itself, and the, the reality is, is we have a lot of different English translations that are wonderful translations, and I would encourage you when you're studying a, a book of the Bible, like Ephesians, uh, look 
uh, look through a lot of different translations and, um, you know, read all the way through in one translation, then read all the way through the book in another translation. In fact, while we're doing this study, I would encourage you, um, read through the book of Ephesians every single week. It's six chapters, so you could take one chapter a day and read through the book in, say, the English Standard Version, the ESV, one week. And then the next week, read through it in the NIV, which is the version we most often use in our teaching. Mm -hmm. Or then you could use the Contemporary Standard Version. Or There's just so many good translations, and I, I would just encourage you to, to just explore different translations and, and use those in your study. That'll be really illuminating uh, to see how the different translations kind of um, take the, the Greek in this particular case and bring it into English, and you'll learn some things that way. Um, the other thing is to get a good study Bible. I brought one of mine. I've got several different study Bibles. This is a CSB uh, Christian Worldview Study Bible. It's kind of a yeah. unique study Bible. And so with most study Bibles, what you'll find is there's just a, you know, there's like usually a center column reference and it'll have cross references and it'll have like little numbers or letters in the text itself. And it'll, then you look over in the margin, it'll tell you where you can go to kind of see this same idea maybe spoken of somewhere else. It'll also have some editor's notes down, usually at the bottom, kind of explaining maybe some of the nuances that are in the text. So these are really helpful tools. Uh, this particular study Bible even has articles that uh, are kind of interspersed throughout it. So it's, it's a nice um, tool. Uh, if I could recommend one thing for, um, for you, uh, it's uh, the Blue Letter Study Bible. It is, um, it's free software. Um, and so you go to blueletterbible.org and uh, you can just get on there. You can, um, you can look at a, a scripture passage in uh, lots of different translations, but it's also got um, a lot of tools. So like it has Bible dictionaries. So like if you're looking at a word, like in Ephesians 1, there's the word predestined. And which is a kind of an interesting word. So you can um, actually look up that word and see what the Greek word behind it is and see kind of how it's used. And, um, but there's lots of great tools you can get on uh, blueletterbible.org uh, and you can kind of explore. That's a really excellent resource. Some other ones that you may already know is the Version Bible. Mm -hmm. Again, lots of different translations are available on that and lots of different Bible studies that have been created for people. And so that's a, that's a helpful resource. I really like the guide guys um, that are up in Portland that do some of those videos we've been using in our sermon yeah. series. So um, if, if you kind of enjoyed some of those, you can get on uh, Read Scripture app, mm -hmm. and uh, they've got a whole plan to read through the Bible, and like they've even got some plans for Ephesians. And so if you open up their page on Ephesians, you can watch the, the Bible Project video on Ephesians, and then mm -hmm. it gives you uh, a plan for how to read through it and some additional things to do. And uh, so that one's called Read Scripture, that app. And then probably my personal favorite is the Faith Life Study Bible, which has lots of different tools. You can just click on a word and it'll pull up a, a, a definition for you. Really, really helpful tools. And uh, so those are just a few things that I would, I would recommend using. For yeah. I could eliminate like two shelves just based on what you just showed me in digital form. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. There's all kinds of good stuff in yeah. there. So. Yeah. The, the read scripture is great. I love yeah. that one. Uh, the Bible project videos. I, I, anytime we're jumping into a new series, I, I always go to them yeah. and just watch their summarizing video of whatever book we're in, yep. you know, so man, helpful. they do such a good job. Yeah. Such a good job. So, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's the idea, right? We, we want to study God's word and we want to slow down um, mm. so often we, I, I, you know, I, I hear it all the time and I think it's well-intended and it's good to, uh, read through the Bible in a year. Yeah. Uh, but we miss a lot, like to move through the entire Bible in a year. Uh, we, you can read it for sure, yeah. but can you really grasp everything God's wanting to communicate to you yeah. in a year? No. I mean, I would make the argument, we're not going to grasp everything in a lifetime. Yeah. Um, but you know, we, we really want to encourage you to slow down. Um, I would, we, even like we said earlier, 12 weeks in Ephesians seems fast Yeah. and it's only six chapters. Yeah. You, you go to Genesis, that's what, 52 chapters or, you yeah. know, man, that's, that's a long book. You yeah. know, you spend a lot of time in, in some of these. So um, that's the idea. But anytime we get into studying a, a, a book in the Bible, when we're just starting off, Again, we want to go back to that original audience. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm tasked with Ephesians chapter one, <laughs> verses one and two. That's it. Two, yep. two verses. Uh, and that's very short and very simple. Uh, in fact, a lot of the times I think are when I, I'm guilty of this too, when, when, I, when I'm reading and I get to one of the letters or whatever, one of the epistles, I scan over the 
the introduction or the, yeah. the greeting that, that Paul might have yeah. to his audience because it's simple. Yeah. And I don't, I don't think there's a whole lot in there, but there's usually a ton in yeah. there, especially when you want to know who, who these people were that, that Paul was writing to. And so even today, before we get into Ephesians 1, I want to look back and, and look at the church in Ephesus cool. and the city of, of, of Ephesus. And, um, and it's actually mentioned more than just here in Ephesians. Right. Uh, we, we read about it in Revelation chapter 2, and then we read about it in, in Acts 19 and 20. Mm-hmm. Um, and so kind of want to go there first right. and, and start there. And so if you have your Bibles... You can open up to Revelation chapter 2. You probably didn't think you were going to be opening your Bible to (laughs) Revelation when we were starting a series in Ephesians. But I want to read it to you really quick. reads this. It says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. That is a really fancy way of saying Jesus. Mm -hmm. So there we go. So this is Jesus, and Jesus says, I know the deeds of your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles and are not, uh, and you have found them to be false. You have... uh, You have... You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, here we've got Jesus. And, and he's doing two things. I mean, he's commending the church in yeah. Ephesus, but then he's also correcting them yeah. um, almost in just one breath. And, and the first thing that we see that they're doing well is they are, they're, they're standing strong against false teachers. Yeah. And, and this was something that was prevalent in this time. Um, to this day, I would say it's prevalent. Uh, even in churches in America, we, we have churches that fly under the banner of quote unquote Jesus, mm-hmm. um, but man, they really do, don't preach God's word. Yeah. Um, we can't just slap Jesus on something and, and call it biblical. Yeah. And so we got to be careful about that. And, and not just you know Ephesus, but a lot of other churches in the first century were experiencing these, these false teachers coming in. Yeah. And so fortunately, Ephesus is standing up against them and, and and doing that well to, yeah. to the point where Jesus commends them for it. Um, and, and that's great too, because when you think about it, this isn't just something for the church of Ephesus. Uh, Jesus d- modeled it in his ministry. You know, he was constantly calling out like yeah. the, the Pharisees and whatnot. Uh, but then, you know, we see the apostles do it, especially Paul right. um, is always seeming to having to correct or fix false yeah. teaching. And then, um, then Eph- Ephesus is doing it too. And so this was a, this was a function of the, the local churches in the first century uh, right. to, to hold true, true to, to, to biblical doctrine. Mm-hmm. And we should be doing that as well. But, you know, with Ephesus in particular, I think what's fun about Ephesus is that we see there was a lot of attention put on this church. Um, the Apostle Paul was uh, obviously spent an extended period of time there and teaching yeah. them and building them up in, in doctrine, their, their understanding of, of Scripture and who God is and what we believe. Um, we, we, we know that the Apostle John spent time right. in Ephesus, mm-hmm. and which is crazy because we don't really think of that too much. Uh, Timothy, the pastor of right. Ephesus, and we read about Timothy a ton. I mean, even Paul writes him two letters. Yep. And then uh, some of these, some I don't know if you've ever read this. I just kind of came across this. There's a lot of biblical scholars out there that even make an argument that Peter spent time in mm-hmm. Ephesus. And so I'd have to look yeah. into that a little right. bit more. But I read that and I'm like, okay, like... Ephesus got a lot of attention yeah. from the apostles. Um, and and so here are these guys. I mean, these are, at that time, first century, these are the heavy hitters, right? Yeah, like, these right. are the big names. Yeah. And they're spending a lot of time in Ephesus building them up and instructing them. And and mainly because when you look at... So Ephesus was, you know, in Asia Minor, right? right. Modern-day Turkey yeah. at this point. Um, they were There were a lot of churches in that area, but Ephesus was like the hub, right? Um, so that was... Everything kind of flowed out of Ephesus, um, the, Eph- the Ephesian church, into the other churches of, right. of the area. So yeah. it would make sense then that yep. they got a lot of attention because then their pastors are going out to these other churches and, t- and teaching them as well and training them up. So so they get a lot of, uh, a lot of attention and they end up... 
um, getting a lot of really sound doctrine built into their church. Like, this is where you go if you want to learn scripture. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it it was really cool to see that. And you can only imagine, like, the impact that would have had on that congregation yeah. in general. So, um, so we see that, like, this is where they start. And then we, we, we read in revelation two, like where they're ending and yeah. it's not ending up very well for them. Mm-hmm. And, and that's sad, right? The, the sad reality. But even in, in verse four, Jesus says that you've forsaken the love you had at first. Mm. And, and that, I mean, I know when I read that, it stops me in my tracks. Like, yeah. what is this love that he's talking about? Yeah. Um, because it's obviously something that is bothering Jesus, yeah. right? And and I know that a lot of times we read that and instantly we think that Jesus is maybe talking about himself, that that they've lost their love for him. Mm. And we, we know that's not the case because when you just read into the next verse, in yeah. verse 5, it says that... Um, it, it, they're, they're told to do the things they did at first. So, so Jesus isn't talking about a faith issue with mm. the Ephesians. He's talking about their deeds, yeah. the things that they're doing, putting their faith into practice. And um, again, knowing that they had good doctrine and that they were rejecting these false teachers, they still were setting aside the important work of the church. Mm. And, and more than likely, were starting to seek their own self-interests. Yep. And man, I mean, that's easy for any of us to do at that yeah. point. So, you know, Jesus is, is basically telling them, you need to repent of this. And if you don't, then I'm going to remove your lampstand. And basically what he's saying is, you know, if, if you're not going to fulfill your purpose as a church and, and do the deeds of the faith, then I don't have a whole lot of need for you anymore. Yeah. And man, that's that's a warning. Like yeah. if Jesus showed up here at HDC and said, you guys are dropping the ball, and if you don't fix this, like we're just going to stop doing church here. Yeah. I know that would get my attention yeah. for sure. I mean, Jesus just showing up in general at HDC <laughs> would get my attention, right? <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so he's he's telling them to, to live out their faith, right? Put yeah. it into practice. And, and this isn't like a one-off in Revelation. It's it's a it's a principle that's taught throughout Scripture. Right. I mean, you know, the whole book of James pretty much parallels that idea that mm-hmm. your faith without works is is dead. Yeah. 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 So um, our our faith should lead us towards action, mm-hmm. not as a means of salvation, but as a result of our salvation. Right. So it's what he's kind of calling the Church of Ephesus out to. But there were a lot of things that would distract the Ephesian believers. When we look at the city and we look at the culture that they lived in, I mean, man, yeah. it's incredible. It's quite a place. I've, I've, in my studies, I've come to the conclusion if I lived in the first century, 100% I would want to live in Ephesus because, I mean, they had everything there. It yeah. was wealthy. It had entertainment. I mean, it was it was a happening place. Yeah. Like, it would have been a really fun place to live for yeah. sure. Um, lots of things to, to do, lots of things to occupy my time. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, a lot of, a lot of fun and not, not necessarily, I mean, some of it was pretty bad, but yeah. you know, again, the idea of entertainment and having things to do and, and all that is, it's not a bad thing, but it can be if it gets in the way of, of what God calls us to, to be doing. Right. Yeah. So you've got this, the city that is incredibly wealthy. It's an important and powerful city in the Roman Empire. In fact, I didn't. I, I just learned this. It was the fourth largest city in all of the Roman Empire. Oh, wow! So wow. it's uh, it's it's big. It's got it's got a lot of power there. Um, it was a port city. So you think of like the port of L.A., right, where yeah. all the all the tanker ships are coming in. You got all the cranes unloading stuff yeah. because we're getting imports from everywhere. We're exporting things as well. Yeah. That was Ephesus. They had a port, and so they had ships bringing commodities in from all over the world. <clears throat> they were able to export things out. Out, so making them a ton of money. Yeah. And so they have this like hustle and bustle commerce. And uh, unfortunately, though, that that port that was so vital to their economy started to silt up, meaning like the dirt, you know, at the bottom of the ocean started pushing right. its way into the the harbor. Yep. And so eventually that water started to get real shallow, making it tough for the ships to get in yeah. and out of. So now they're going, oh, no, what do we do? Like, this is our bread and butter. If we lose this, what happens to our city? Yeah. So they start to reinvent themselves a little bit. And this is where entertainment comes in. Right. So they're yeah. like, OK, if, if we're not going to be a place where ships are bringing commodities in and out and trades are our main you know, line of work, 
let's get into the entertainment business and the tourism business. Let's get people to come to us rather than commodities. Mm. And so now they're, they're advertising themselves as like the place to vacation. Yeah. And so you got people coming from all over the, the known world uh, just to have their vacations, have their time off and, and spend time and relax, right? Like that's, that's the destination spot. Mm. And so uh, they had some, they had a couple things, they had a lot of things there, but there's two things that really like stood out as I was looking at what the city consisted of. The first was the temple to Artemis. And Mm -hmm. um, this, this place was incredible. I mean, massive, huge, the ruins of it are still there today. You can, you can go to this place. It's, uh, um, it's one of the seven, it's one of the seven wonders of the ancient world that you can go visit. I mean, crazy, right? Um, And so they were luring people there. Um, There's a whole lot I can go into who Artemis was. Diana, if you were a Roman, so it kind of depend on who, you know, Greek Roman. Greek Roman. Yep. And so, uh, but yeah, you know, it's, it's weird. I don't know quite how they came to this conclusion, but you know, Artemis was like this uh, Greek god of like wildlife and hunting and all this other kind of stuff. But then also somewhere along the line got connected to fertility and so with that in mind, they thought, well, let's have temple prostitutes and yeah. you can worship her through that. And you had people coming from all over just to go to the temple to partake in that wow. um, and paying big money for that. Yeah. Um, so much so that they got they had so many people coming, so much money coming in. They didn't know what to do with this amount of money, um, found out that they actually started banking out of this. Um, wow. and, and so like they, they're, what do we do with this money? Well, let's start loaning it out and, and getting interest on it and have our money make money for us, you right. know? And, and, you know, I think of a bank, like if I'm getting a mortgage, I, I show up, I fill out the paperwork, they evaluate me like, yeah, I'll give you a mortgage. They weren't dealing with the small guys like me. They were, they were actually loaning money out to Kings and Queens. Like they were financing oh, wow. nations out of this bank that the money all just came from temple prostitution. So, wow. you know, we, we make, there's the saying today that sex sells. Yeah. Well, that was true in the first century, yeah. apparently as well. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely insane, despicable, but at the same time, like, yeah. wow. I mean, this was a big deal. And uh, not only did they have that, but they had this other, it's another thing you can go visit today. The ruins of it was their theater. Hmm. And so they had this massive theater had like capacity of 25,000 people. Wow. That's a big concert, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, plays, concerts, whatever. I've gone to concerts that are that big. And yeah. I, I mean, it's, I get uncomfortable in big crowds. So, you know, <laughs> I'd have been uncomfortable there too, but yeah, it, I mean, just a lot was happening. You had food, you had commerce, you had entertainment and banking and finance. You know, when you start thinking about it, it's like, I can name off some cities in the U S that, sound very similar yeah. to that, you know, maybe even most <laughs> of the U S in, in general, but, um, you know, if you wanted to make a name for yourself, you went to Ephesus, yeah. you know, you, you hear the people like I'm going to Hollywood and I'm going to get my foot in the entertainment industry or whatever. I'm going to yeah. get in the movie biz. Make a name but, for myself. Yep, yeah. That was, that was Ephesus. Like yeah. that's where you went if you wanted to do that. And so, you know, when we look back at Jesus correction of the church there, we can see how easy it would have been for them to get distracted wow. yeah. and, and to start focusing on themselves rather than those that were around them. Mm. And, and so, and the sad thing is, is they didn't listen to Jesus because, you know, wasn't even, you know, two decades later, second, second century, but at, at the point of the second century, let's just say this, it was, it was ruins. Yeah. The city was gone. The church wow. was unheard of at this point, you know, wow. the church wasn't there. Um, the port completely silted up and, you know, it was gone. The, mm. the whole city to this day, you can go there. This booming metropolis is now just ruins. Wow. And so um, it was pretty sad to see kind of what it came to. So that's where they ended. Mm. But, you know, we look back at to where they began and you go back into the book of Acts. Yeah. And so if you got your Bibles, you can flip over to, to the book of Acts really quick in chapter 20. But Paul originally plants this church here in in Ephesus. He eventually spends like three and a half years there training them up and equipping them to do the ministry. But then when we look at Acts chapter 20, Paul's on his way back. He's on his missionary journey, and now he's making his way back to Jerusalem. It's been made pretty clear to him what's going to happen to him in Jerusalem. He's going to end up getting arrested. Ultimately, he's going to be martyred for his faith, and he's making his way back regardless. And as he's on his way down, he, he intentionally sails past Ephesus because he's, it says he's trying to 
you know, save some time, mm -hmm. um, sails past Ephesus and he ends up in Miletus and, and that looking at a map is about 36 miles or so south of, of Ephesus. Right. And so he gets there, but then he still calls for the elders, the pastors of Ephesus to come and meet him. And he, again, knowing that this is it, like, this is the last time I'm going to see these guys. And, you know, I know for me doing ministry, you know, with, with, with you and, and other people here at HDC, like you build a bond, yeah. um, you know, even for, for people who, who are, you know, they're serving the church or whatever, you don't necessarily have to be a pastor to get super connected with right. the people you do ministry with. Like yeah. that is a bond beyond, you know, yeah. anything else. Yeah. And uh, so he has this very unique bond with these, mm. with these guys. And, and he says, Hey, come meet me here. And he knows this is it. Like this, these are my parting words mm. to, to, to my brothers and sisters in Ephesus. And so, um, so he's got the guys, they show up and we, um, we pick up in verse 32 that he says a lot, but I just want to pick up in 32 through 35, um, kind of his last words. He says, now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing, <clears throat> but you yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remember the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So now he, he starts off in this like closing statement. You know, he says that, uh, um, that, that God and his word will, will give them an inheritance. And this, mm. this idea of an inheritance is not unique, but it's, it's definitely used regularly with, uh, the, with the people in Ephesus, with the Ephesians, mm. because we don't, we don't just read it here. He's mentioning obviously the, in, in Acts 20, this idea of an inheritance, but in Ephesians chapter one, verse 14, yeah. he mentions inheritance again. Yeah. I'm not going to get into that because yeah. next week, Pastor Kurt's going to talk a little bit right. more about that. So yeah. um, I'll leave that for him. That's a whole nother topic. But Paul speaks to people that are, are living in this culture that I just described, right? This very wealthy culture and, and an idea of an inheritance would have been a big deal to them, right? Like if they're wealthy, any wealthy person knows, like, I'm not going to be around forever and I'm not taking it with me when I go. So who do I leave it to? Right. right. And so there's always this, this idea of an inheritance and, and Paul has to continually remind them that, that there's, there's more than just earthly wealth and riches. Yeah. There's also heavenly riches. Yeah. And that's what he's always kind of pointing them back to, um, as, as people that just live in a wealthy society. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and there's nothing wrong again. Like, I think we sometimes hear this stuff and we think there's gotta be something wrong with wealth. Right. And, and we, we kind of demonize that in a way, but it, it's not like, it's not wrong for somebody to be wealthy. I mean, obviously they've got to earn it honestly, yeah. you know, yeah. but, uh, but yeah, honest wealth, there, there's nothing wrong with that. But I will say that, that anybody I've ever talked to that is wealthy will, will tell you it's distracting. Yeah. Not, not even necessarily the wealth itself, but obtaining the wealth, just yeah. getting it is distracting. Yeah. I mean, it, it pulls you from your family, your friends, right. pulls you from your health. I mean, a lot yeah. of things, right. And, and more importantly, with, with people that I've spoken to that are wealthy will say that like, it is so easy to get distracted from my faith in, mm. in this pursuit. Right. And so, you know, we just, we just have to be careful about that. Right. It's, it's, you always hear people say that, you know, money's the root of all evil and they totally misquote that it's, yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's the love of the money yeah. that, that does it. And so, you know, in that pursuit, what do you love? Do you love, mm. Do you love money? Do you love the wealth or do you love the Lord? Mm. Um, and so again, something that would have been super applicable to the, the people in, in Ephesus. Um, and he, and he continues by saying like, I didn't, I didn't covet anybody's gold or silver or clothing and things like that. Um, and he, he even says he supplied his own needs, yeah. uh, which is unique because we look at Paul as this like first, you know, missionary. Right? right. And, and even today when we look at missionaries, what do they do? They raise support right. to go out and do the ministry that they do. Um, they don't get a paycheck for going to Papua New Guinea or wherever right. in the world, you know, yeah. they've, they've got to have people support them. But Paul in this moment, even though he did raise support, he says, when I was with you in Ephesus, I supplied my own needs. Mm. And there's, there's, hmm. there's a lot to that yeah, and, and more than I, than we would have time to yeah. really kind of unpack right now. But at the same time, you know, he's, he, we see him just setting an example, 
Yeah. You know, it, it, he could have very easily done what he needed. He could have trained them up. He could have built up that church and still pursued wealth. I mean, when you, when you read even more in 19 and 20 of Acts, like what Paul did in Ephesus, right. oh, he could have monetized that real quick. Yep. I mean, man, you're, you're doing that kind of stuff in front of wealthy people and yeah. say, I'll keep doing this if you give me money. Right. Well, they'll keep giving money. Yeah. He would have been a wealthy man by the time it was all said and done. But what's he do? He just takes care of his own needs. Mm. And so he's just setting this, this model and this example. And I read stuff like that. And we, we, we even hear Paul say, like, watch me, model me, do what I do as I model Christ, you know? Yep. And I, I don't know if I could say that about myself. <laughs> like, I know myself too right. well to say... Right. Watch me. I mean, I, I would hope I could. Right. You yeah. know, but I still know my my and Paul did, too, though. Right. Paul says, like, yeah. I know what I should do and I don't do it. And I, I I don't do the things I should be doing. So Paul had his issues, too. But man, just to be able to model Jesus that well yeah. to a group of people is is pretty incredible. And, and that's what he's doing here, even when it comes to to wealth. And then in his final words to the Ephesian elders, verse 35. I mean, this is the the final of the final. He says, in everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than receive. He says, we've, we've got to help the weak. Mm. And that doesn't take a whole lot of difficulty, you know, jumping through hoops, using a bunch of tools to interpret what that means. We've mm. got to help the weak. Now, he could have said to them, you got to know your soteriology. You got to know your, your pneumatology and Christology and, and yeah. ecclesi- ecclesiology, eschatology, all, like yeah. all these big doctrinal things, right? Yeah. But they already knew that stuff. Yeah. They'd been trained up for a lot of years in that. It was help the weak. That simple. Mm. You guys have all this together. Don't miss out on this. This yeah. is what the Lord wants out of you. Help the weak. Serve others. Be others focused. Um, he he totally goes around any type of big doctrine stuff because he knows where they're at already on that. And he knows their shortcomings too, having spent so much time with them. Help the weak. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and there's things that, you know, even as we give that, um, that Paul's referencing here, you, you think about today, you know, the three main things we give, time, treasure, talent. Yep. Right. Like when you categorize everything, that's, those are the three. And especially when it comes to the kingdom of God and yep. within the church, like those are the things that we give. And, and when we, when I hear this, this phrase, this, or this next sentence that, that Paul quotes Jesus on saying, unfortunately we have, you know, cheapened it and, and turned it into this cliche for generosity, but you know, it's better to give than receive. We hear that all the time. I don't know about you. But now I like giving. I do like that. Like if you and I go to lunch, like I like to be able to pick up the tab. Mm-hmm. It's just enjoyable for me. But when, if we're talking like a hundred grand here and it's me giving you a hundred grand or you giving me a hundred yeah. grand. That's uncomfortable. It, it's not better for me to <laughs> give than receive in this situation, Mike. I would right. rather have you give me the hundred grand than me give you a hundred grand. <laughs> And that's because like when we look at that phrase through that lens, a worldly lens, that's the conclusion we come to. It's a total lie when we look at it through a worldly lens. But when we look through a a biblical godly lens, we see the, the, the value and, and the reward, the blessing of, Mm -hmm. of giving, you know, our time, talent, and treasure within the church for the sake of God. It is always better to give than to receive in that situation. So much more of a blessing. Um, and, and I say all that just to, you know, to, to point us towards the fact that Paul tells them to, to generously put their faith into action, mm. right? To, to not forsake this, this first love. Yep. He's telling them, just like Jesus told them in Revelation 2, do the deeds. Yep. Don't, this is your first love. Don't forsake this. And then literally two short decades later, you got Jesus saying, you did. Yeah. You forsook your first love. Mm. And that's heavy and that's hard. You guys, he's, they, they went all doctrine, no action, right? Yeah. You might, my, my friends in Texas would say all hat, no cattle. Yeah. Um, I got a friend who's a pilot. He says things like all thrust, no vector. Uh, yeah. You know, you're all yeah. power, but you got no heading. You got nowhere to go, right? Yeah. Um, and, and that's the mistake we, that we can make when it comes to living out our faith and knowing what it says, right? We can, we can swing far to the either, either end of that pendulum swing. And I've spent a lot of time in my own life on 
each end of that where yeah. I'm like doing all this stuff and wanting to be a good person, but I really am not paying any attention to God's word. I just, it feels good. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what God would want me to do. And then I've had other times in my life where I'm like highly focused on studying God's word and just obtaining all this knowledge, but not allowing it to transform me. Mm. And that's neither one of those is healthy. So Paul is trying to level out the pendulum swing here too. We've got to find that, that balance. And so I say all of that and I've been talking for a while and we're supposed to be in this study of Ephesians. Let's finally like actually go to Ephesians. Right. <laughs> so feels like uh, it was a big setup, but you know, you, again, you got to do this stuff, right? right? You got to, you got to know where, where, where you're at, who the audience was and all that kind of stuff to really get a good understanding. So Ephesians chapter one, verses one and two says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God, our father, the Lord Jesus Christ. So those first two verses, super simple. Like I said, at the beginning, I skim over those yep. all the time. And, and, and it's easy to do easy that, right? Easy to do. Yeah. But now having looked at who Ephesus was and who the Ephesians were, yeah. we know who Paul's talking to, yeah. which gives us a good framework to, to really look at what he says in the, the rest of this letter. Mm -hmm. But I've got a question for you, Mike. I'm, I'm looking at this, okay? And, and if I'm going to study my Bible, and we have folks joining us that are really taking a good look at their Bible, we prompted them to read slowly, and I'm guessing their Bible does the same thing mine does. Yours probably has it too. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm reading slowly, and I read in verse 1, to God's holy people in Ephesus, there's a little letter A next to that. Mm -hmm. Yep, Noting, putting a little footnote there, and I look down at that little footnote, and it says, some early manuscripts do not have in Ephesus. What are we supposed to do with that? Right. What does that mean, Mike? Right. Well, so when Paul wrote this originally in Greek, um, we don't have that, that very first document that he wrote. We have copies. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is when, when uh, people start putting together the, the manuscripts from which we translate um, our English version, um, some of those early manuscripts didn't have the letter, the words in mm -hmm. Ephesus in, in those early versions, which would make you think, well, if those date back closer to the Apostle Paul and they didn't have it, could it be that he wasn't actually writing a letter to the mm -hmm. church in Ephesus? Was he writing it just to God's holy people? Mm. So it, that's, that's a possibility. That could be what that means. Um, it's it's interesting because when you compare the letter of, of Ephesians to others of Paul's letters, um, there's very little that's real personal. Like he doesn't have a long list of people he greets, mm -hmm. you know, at the end, or like he does in so many of his letters. And he's not even addressing like real specific issues for like the church in Ephesus. It's pretty generic in many ways as if he was writing to God's holy people wherever they are. Mm -hmm. So uh, a case could be made that this was just a general letter of the Apostle Paul to churches and it was gonna go to the churches in Asia Minor. Mm -hmm. I think the reality is is it probably um, if, if it was that case it probably started in Ephesus and maybe that's where those those words came um, and people started as they would uh, copy. They just added that. Mm -hmm. uh, could be. Um, at the end of the day, it, it doesn't take away from this being God's word, and we know that this is true, and we know that everything that he wrote, whether it's to God's holy people in Ephesus or not, or whether it's specifically to the people in, in Ephesus, there's so much we can learn, and the reality is, again, Ephesus was an influential city mm -hmm to all the, the area of Asia Minor where all the other churches that would have gotten this letter were. Yeah. And so everything that Paul was going to write to them, whether it was specifically to the Ephesians or to the people generally in that area, it was all very applicable. So I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah, it yeah. is. Yeah, and it, you know, it makes sense too. I mean, if, if Paul is going to write a letter even to, the, to God's holy people in yeah. Asia Minor for this matter, it's it's going to end up in Ephesus first because yep. everything flowed out everything of that. Everything came yep, through so, there. <laughs> yeah. And then again, you know, we do know that Paul spent 
you know, a so lot of, a lot of time and put a lot of yeah. effort into the Ephesian yeah. church. Like he knew I can get this to them. They would They'll distribute it out accurately and, yeah. and keep it within what it, what I intended to be. And so, so yeah, I mean, that, that it makes sense that we yeah. would still call it Ephesians at this point. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And so, yeah, it'll be good. But you know, at the same time, when you think about that, right, mm. the Bible was not written to you or to me right. or any of us for that matter. It was written to God's holy people in Asia Minor, Ephes- Ephesus, whatever. Um, but it still applies to us. Yeah. So regardless of, of who this was written to or any book of the Bible for that matter, or any epistle, it was written to an original audience. Yeah. And, and so written to them, but for us. Yep. And so we always have to look at it through that lens. Yep. So it, it doesn't necessarily dis- d- detract from what the message is of, of Ephesians. No, so, but uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very comfortable. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not a, a scholar by any means, but I'm very comfortable <laughs> looking at, you know, the manuscripts that we have and, and just the, the yeah. care that went into the, the preservation of scripture yeah. that, that what we have here is 100% accurate, 100% yep. what, what God has intended us to have. Yep. And so even though you might see little footnotes or little discrepancies here and there or whatever, mm-hmm. things that make you scratch your head, I don't I don't look at this and go, well, throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah, you no, know? not like, at all. No, this is exactly what, what God wants wants us to have, intended yeah. for us for to have so that we could, you know, know who he is and then live it out, yep. right? Live out our faith. And, and that again, is the message of, of the Ephesians, yep. uh, the letter to the Ephesians. Yep. Know who I am, live it out. Yep. And so even as we, you know, go through the next 12 weeks yep. of this study, um, I'm, I'm excited to, to kind of balance that out. I'm, I'm excited for you and your groups to, to kind of dive into this as well and, and apply it to your life. And, yeah. and that's kind of how this is going to work, right? Like we're going to cover the, what does it say? What does it mean in, right. in this, these videos, but then the groups have their questions. Yeah. And, and so those are all application questions. Yeah. So even thinking through like, man, what, what does, what, what is this passage saying? What does it mean? Like really meditate on it. Yeah. You know, like that's something that I think we, we fail to do sometimes we, we read, um, but we don't meditate on God's word. Mm-hmm. And I know that word kind of has some baggage <laughs> to it, right? Like some right. people have different definitions yeah. to meditate, but right. really it's just to sit there and dwell on God's word. Yeah. Um, I, I, I do that personally when I'm in my car, when yeah. I'm driving, you know, it, it takes me 17 minutes to get from my house to my office. And I know other people have a way longer commute than that, but I, I use that time to, to, to mull over what I read that, that morning yeah. in God's word, you know, where, how does this a- apply to my life? Like, yeah. where does this apply in my marriage? Where does this apply in, in my, the, the fact that I'm a dad, right? To how do I raise my kids um, at work? Like, how does, how does what I read in God's word today apply to my work life? You yeah. know, like, that's, that's what I think a lot of people fail to do. We like to check the box. Mm-hmm. I read four chapters. I read five chapters in God's word today, yeah. which is good. We should like, but how much did you get out of it? Yeah. How much did you really learn from it? How much are you yeah. like meditating on and, and applying to your life? And so, so that's, that's our challenge to, to you as we do these studies, hear these, listen to these videos. Some, some might be listening to us as they're driving down the car. Some might actually be sitting there watching us and right. seeing our ugly mugs yeah. as we, as we do this. <laughs> but, uh, but no, I mean, take what we're saying, take what you're learning in this and, and really start mulling over it and thinking through how does this apply? So that way, when you get in, to your group and your group leader asks those questions, yeah. you, you've already been thinking about this. You're ready for a discussion. So yeah. we're excited. Mike, you got anything else you want to share yeah. this week? Well, just thinking back even to the title of, uh, of this series, mm-hmm. um, you know, live and learn or learn and live, uh, back in my, um, back in my early, you know, young years, eight, late teens, early twenties, um, I remember hearing a guy, I can't, can't exactly pinpoint the time, but I remember this phrase. He said, truth that is learned but is not lived forms calluses on your heart. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's important that, um, you know, we can do a lot of learning. We can fill our head with a lot of information. But if we aren't thinking through how do I actually live this out, what happens is, is our hearts just kind of kind of get probably to that same place where the Ephesians were, where Jesus came to him and said, you've, you've 
it's not you're not doing the things that you did when you mm. first came to know me mm. you've left your first love and so that would be I, I guess my encouragement is make sure that you're really um, seriously giving yourself to this idea of how do I live this out mm. and uh, and I love the fact that we're doing this in community because you're gonna probably learn maybe even from the other people in your group like um, you know how, how they have been challenged to live it out and you might go yeah, I need to do that too. Mm -hmm. Or you may come together as a group and say, you know what, we should do this together as yeah. a group. And so I, I'm really hopeful that we'll start hearing reports back of what God has been teaching them that is being lived out now as a result of this study. So that's that's my excitement. Yep, that's awesome. Well, I say we ended on that because right. I don't know what else to say. Good. So that's great. Well, have a great week and uh, enjoy your time in God's Word. And then we will see you next week.